Grant, we beseech thee, merciful Lord, to thy faithful people, pardon and peace, that they may be cleansed from all their sins and serve thee with a quiet mind through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Verse 1 of Lent, hymn number 147. Now let us with all with one accord in company with ages past keep vigil with our heavenly Lord in his temptation to fast. What well, we turn our attention to Professor Albright, Archaeology and the Religion of the Old Testament. Uh, he said famously that archaeology is indicated the biblical record he was constantly annoyed with the German liberals who couldn't see through their their nose he got a lot of degrees this is published in 1953 copyright John Hopkins Press 1942 this is a 1953 edition Only 268 pages. It airs lectures of the uh, Colgate Rochester Divinity School, Rochester, New York. Their lectureship was founded in May 1928 in the Rochester Theological Seminary. The gift of $25,000 from Mr. and Mrs. Wilfred Frey of Camden, New Jersey, to perpetuate the memory of Mrs. Fry's father, the late Mr. Francis Whalen Ayer. At the time of his death, Mr. Ayer was president of the corporation which maintained the Rochester Theological Seminary. Shortly after the establishment of the lectureship, the Rochester Theological Seminary and Colgate Theological Seminary were united under the name of Colgate Rochester Divinity School. It's under the auspices of this institution that the lectures are given. Under the terms of the foundation, the lectures are fall within the broad category of interpretation of the Christian religion and message. It is the desire of those connected with the establishment and administration, administration of the lecture, so that the lecture shall be religiously constructive <laughs> and shall help in building the Christian faith. Four lectures are to be given each year at the Colgate Rochester Divinity School at Rochester, New York, and these lectures are to be published in a book form within one year. After the time of their delivery, these will be known as the lecture, Ayer Lectures. The lecturer for the year 1940-41 was William Foxwell Albright, W.W. Spence Professor of Semitic Languages, John Hopkins University. His subject was the archaeology and religion of Israel. Okay, some... Some... Uh, a brief preface. Preface. The book contains. Who, who wrote this? Everybody. If it's by the author, we'll read it. If it's not, look, it's by the author, 1942. So we'll read it rather than some guy sticking his nose in. This book contains the substance of air lectures, which I had the honor to deliver at Colgate Rochester Divinity School in April 1941. I've expanded the four lectures, which were actually given then by the addition of chapter three, as well as including matter not suitable for oral presentation. The addition of copious notes will, it, hope, it is hoped, make the volume more useful to both students and scholars. It is in no sense a reproduction of my larger book, From the Stone Age to Christianity, in shorter or more popular form. At least 90% of the material in this volume will not be found there at all. Whenever any subject was adequately treated, I, there, I refer the reader to it. 
On the other hand, I've constantly endeavored to complement the treatment of Israelite religion and related matters, which was given in that book, in order to make the task for the reader as easy as possible. I'm indebted with my friends, Dr. H. M. Orlinsky, Professor O. R. Sellers, and Mr. John Thompson, and others who did the, some of the editorial work. Um, dedication to some friends. Chapter 1, Archaeology in the Ancient Near East. Chapter 2, Archaeological Background of the Old Testament. Chapter 3, Archaeology and the Religion of the Canaanites. 4, Archaeology and the Religion of Early Israel. 5, Archaeology and the Religion of Later Israel. <clears throat> and the usual chord, Archaeology in Ancient Near Eastern Mind. The rapidly increasing mass of archaeological data from the ancient Near East has hitherto remained singularly sterile so far as its effect upon our historical thinking is concerned. Specialists have been too, far too busy accumulating new facts or interpreting facts already collected to give their time to the task of applying this knowledge to other fields where experts in philology have strayed in and out narrowing pastures, the results have been happy, owing either to the fact that their ventures were premature or to, or to their lack of training in the other disciplines. Occasionally results have been brilliant, as when Sir Flinders Petrie proposed his illuminating theory of historical cycles of civilization. Based on his intimate knowledge of Egyptian archaeology, or when Heinrich Schaefer wrote his epoch-making study of the nature of Egyptian line drawing. However, such instances have been few and far between. Most of the attempts to synthesize the archaeology of the Near East have been made by specialists coming from other fields. Examples are numerous. Edward Merritt, Meyer, the classical historian, St. Sir James Fraser, History of Religions, O. Neubmeyer, the mathematician and astronomer, Max Hilsheimer, the vertebrate zoologist. And these are only a few we could name. However, it is not accidental that these encouraged incursions from without hither yield, hitherto yielded only comparatively restricted insights. Specialists in other fields form their views of synthesis and the professional credos of the basis of the doctrine of their predecessors, supplemented or corrected by new data in their own fields. Such specialists cannot be expected to master the new field so completely that the new data will seriously modify the patterns of thought to which they've become accustomed. Moreover, their strength is here their weakness. Thorough indoctrination and the methods and points of weakness in their own fields prevents them from grasping the true meaning and configuration of novel patterns. On the other hand, specialists in the new field are likely to accept novel patterns too hastily without troubling themselves to acquire the critical approach which only an old, well-organized field can de develop. In our recent volume, From Stone Age to Christianity, we stress the significance of the new archaeological knowledge for the horizon of the historian. It was easy to show that archaeological history is, in important respects, the most scientific branch of history, since, however fragmentary it may be, its data belongs mainly to the epistemological domain of typical occurrence, that is, they make it possible for the specialist to formulate judgments about recurring facts. In spite of the fact that the historian of social movements and institutions has to deal constantly with such judgments, and that the historian of civilization deals with little else, it has become proper in intellectual circles to differentiate sharply between history 
as a record of chronologically connected events, facts, as the structure of laws, and science as the structure of laws governing large bodies of facts. History is often supposed to be subjective and science objective by the very nature of the subjects. Without repeating our discussion of a year ago, we must emphasize the fundamental fallacy underlying any such view. There are many branches of history and the historical method which are just as objective and just as logically formulated as corresponding branches of science. There are phases of geology, biology, and meteorology which are just as unpredictable as the course of any political history. And the psychologist has at least as much difficulty finding out how the human brain operates as the political historian has trying to determine the cause of popular movements. At the same time, we stress the organismic character of history. history. History is not a meaningless record of chance happenings or a mere chain of related occurrences. It's a complex web of interacting patterns, each of what, which has its own structure. However difficult it may be to dissect the structure and identify its characteristic elements. Moreover, the web is itself constantly changing and comparing successive states, which it exhibits to the trained eye of the historian. We detect the direction in which it is changing. In other words, its evolution. We also emphasize the fact that the evolution of historical patterns is highly complex and variable. It may move in any direction and it cannot be detected by a priori hypothesis, nor can it be explained by any deterministic theory by by Hegel. We also pointed out that this organismic nature of history makes linear historicism unsuitable as a clue to the complexities of the history of religion. For this reason, Valhausen's Hegelian method anticipated him. was utterly unsuited to become the master key with which scholar, scholars might enter the sanctuary of Israelite religion and acquire a satisfying understanding of it. That it has been a useful tool of historical research we do not, of course, deny. Hitherto little attention has been paid to one of the richest fields to which archaeology can, can contribute the history of the workings of the human mind. There is a rapid and steady increase of interest taken by scholars in the history of ideas. Historians of science, students of national literature, philologians and philosophers are now converging from all directions upon this fascinating and important new domain of the investigator. At the same time, cultural anthropologists, social psychologists, sociologists, and philosophies, philosophers are joining forces to analyze and interpret the workings of the savage mind today. But the gap between savage mentality and the mind of modern man is too great to be easily bridged by direct observation. In the attempt to fill the gap by studying the ideas of half savage peoples of today, today is nearly always vitiated by the fact that these peoples have been strongly influenced by more highly developed civilizations, virtually all of which reflect a post Hellenic stage of progress. In other words, as soon as we begin to st study peoples like the Hova, the Nuba, the Kyrgyz, we find that their higher culture has been profoundly influenced by the influ civilizations which drew heavily from the Greeks, directly or indirectly. In such cases, we can seldom be sure about the aboriginal character of the given cultural element. The only way in which we can bridge this gap, gap satisfactorily is by following the evolution of the human mind in the Near East itself, 
where we can trace it from the earliest times through successive archaeological ages to the flowering of the Greek spirit. Here indeed is an immensely rich, in fact almost virgin, field for research. There's only one drawback to intensive cultivation. The would-be investigator must first undergo an arduous training in archaeology and philology. He must learn new languages and master complex scripts. He must work his way painfully through complicated and recondite domains of learning, the human values of which are far from being obvious even to the advanced student, unless he possesses a clear vision of the goal. When we substitute history of religion for the closely related history of ideas, it may be easier to recognize this goal. What we have in mind is not, not, nothing less than the ultimate reconstruction as far as possible of the route which our cultural ancestors traversed in order to reach Judeo-Christian heights of spiritual insight and ethical monotheism. In this book, we are concerned with the religion of the Old Testament, of which the New is only an extension and fulfillment. We have no illusions about the ease with which somewhat grandiose tasks can be accomplished. In this chapter, we undertake to make a modest beginning by systematizing and analyzing the data which Near Eastern archaeology has accumulated, we can at least provide a foundation on which future scholars can build. The material is so vast and its interpretation so far from being completed that we've had to exercise caution in selecting our data, leaving some of the most striking facts for more adequate future treatment. Moreover, we have only grazed the surface of the available sources, both written and unwritten. Yet we do not believe that our sampling has been one-sided, or that we have failed to give a fair picture of what actually exists in the new world of monuments and documents. After much consideration, we decided not to seek the collaboration of professionals. Ah, spilled my coffee. So be it. There goes my prayer book and hymnal. I'll just have to soak it up. We'll keep going. In the first place, our task is primarily historical, not psychological. In the second place, there is no extraordinary divergence between the views of different. I'm going to put a rag over there. There we go. <clears throat> the writer has read extensively in the field of modern psychology during the past 12 years, following an earlier ambition to combine intense study of psychology with the investigation of the life and thought of the ancient Near East. That's fascinating. Omissions are due not to ignorance, but deliberate intention. The professional psychologist will undoubtedly find classifications and definitions from which he will dissent with good reason. However, it must be remembered that all psychological classification and formulation face a period of re revolutionary readjustment thanks to unprecedented progress, which neurology and experimental psychology are making just now. Accordingly, all such points must remain tentative for the present. Archaeology and man's aesthetic and imaginative faculties. In the three sections which follow, we shall cons for convenience distinguish three categories of mental process and phenomena. Together, these three categories cover most of the activities of the human mind. First, we have the aesthetic and imaginative faculties, which are mainly involved in art, music, and literature. Second come the affective qualities, which are prob primarily responsible for man's emotional and spiritual life. Third, we may list the conceptual 
and reasoning powers which make a man a rational animal. It must be emphasized that these categories are not mutually exclusive, but often overlap. And we must stress the fact that two or three of them are generally brought into operation together. Psychologists are now pointing out effectively that mental processes have been analyzed in the past in terms of the results which they achieve, not of their functional relationship as disclosed by factorial and neurological research. As K.S. Lashley states, even today such terms in classical psychology as emotion, perception, imagination, abstraction, or reasoning do not represent functional groupings of a process of like nature, but only classes of such activities as achieve comparable results. The new methods of analysis, which have been developed by such men as Spearman, Thurstone, and Lashley, are discovering functional variables which do not correspond to functions of classic psychology. We must, for instance, distinguish between capacity and think in terms of the special relationship of objects. At the same time, the old psychological categories retain their descriptive and classificatory value. To the historian, we can judge human mentality in the past only by its results as exhibited in art, literature, religion, etc. These categories are the only ones he can grasp. His interpretations of psychological phenomena may accordingly be historically significant, even though they require reinterpretation in the functional language of recent psychology. In this section, dealing with the aesthetic and imaginative categories of the human mind, we shall draw literary documents as well as artistic remains. Even in the most remote ages which we can control, Aesthetic form and imagery played an important role in literature, especially in verse. The urge for artistic expression sometimes appeared simultaneously in art and literature. Often, however, it was specialized, reaching a high level of achievement in one medium at the same time it was mute in another. Egypt in the Amarna Age, 14th century BC, an attic Greece in the 5th century may be considered as illustrations of parallel attainment in both graphic art and literature. Even Israel and Homeric Greece afford striking examples of the flowering of literature at a time when graphic art remained on a very low level. We find a time and place in which art flourished, but literature language is more difficult since apparent instances may be due to the accidental lack of material. It is likely that the dynasty of Akkad in Mesopotamia provides a high level, an example of a high level in art and a low one in literature. But this may be a false impression due to the accidental paucity of poems dating from this dynasty, 2360 to 2180 BC. It is probable that the Pyramid Age in Egypt, 26 to 2300 BC, was wanting in literature, which could be correlated with its remarkable artistic development. But here again, we may be laboring under a false impression. However, it is remarkable that these two periods, which reached on equal artistic heights, should have left so little literature, which was remembered in later times, or bears intrinsic evidence belonging to both of them. The first phase of art which we can trace may be called imitative aesthetic, since it shows little indication of active imagination, but extraordinary development of imitative capacity, combined with aesthetic feeling, which, which would do credit to a modern European. This phase began between 30 and 20,000 BC in an Aurignacian age of southwestern Europe and continued for many thousands of years until the late Magdalene age. 
The first examples of this cave art were discovered in 1879 at the site of Alta near Santander in northern Spain. And they appeared so incredible to prehistorians that it was a full generation before all competent scholars accepted them as genuine. Subsequent finds in southern France, especially in the Dordogne, have added many new caves and countless specimens of Paleolithic art. In the first months of 1941, a cavern near Montignat in Dordogne revealed the finest examples of Aurignacian art yet brought to light. Nearly all these cave paintings represent animals, the mammoth, woolly rhinoceros, reindeer, stag, wild horse, wild ox, wild goat. Thanks to a study of the stratification in the caves, it's possible to divine a number of evolutionary phases in technique and treatment, beginning with the Aurignacian and passing through the Sol Eutrian into the Magdalenian. Separate units of each painting are definitely perceptual rather than conceptual, demonstrating an extraordinary ability to reproduce what the artist actually saw. It is very seldom that we find both horns and hooves of a bison turned toward the observer, all the rest of the animal is in profile. However, it must be remembered that the number of objects which belong together in a symbol scene are represented conceptually. <clears throat> it's here that we'll call it to an end. I have to do some damage control here on my hymn book and prayer book. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed.